Today we welcome Professor Michael Wise from the London School of Economics and Political Science, of which he was director in pro director from 1983 to 85. Professor of Geography there from 1958 to 1983. President of the International Geographical Union from 1976 to 1980. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much, Anne. And I'm sure you have much that is wise to relate. Would you begin by telling me something of your background and what led you to become a geographer? Well, it's a very difficult question, of course. I was interested in geography quite, quite an early age, being and brought up in Birmingham, England, a massive industrial city. I got interested in um, how it had come to be like it was. Curiosity, if you like, about mm -hmm. the environment. My father was interested in local history, encouraged me, the school encouraged me. When I went to the University of Birmingham as an undergraduate, my teacher there, R. H. Kindrick, understood what I was interested in and encouraged me to study the local environment in some detail. In fact, I think I neglected um, my geomorphology, some aspects of the subject, uh, which I regret in a way, but the advantage was that I was able to devote the time, my bicycle, my maps, 25 inch to the mile, and in a couple of years or so I think I visited every factory, and there are thousands of them in Birmingham, adjacent. Can you give me an idea of the years we're talking this about? This was 1934, 1936, 38, years of uh, when the Depression was still uh, leaving its effects in Britain, when an important Royal Commission had been established, the Which Barlow one? Commission, mm -hmm. looking into the causes of the great shift in population from north to south that was taking place and the lasting effects of the industrial de um, depression on urban life. And my work eventually found its way to that commission as mm -hmm. evidence. Not very much geographical evidence was submitted, but mine was. And the maps are still available in the library at Birmingham and at the LSE. And they go, well, we were able to generalize them and analyze them and build up a picture of how that great industrial city had it had, in fact, escaped the worst effects of the Depression. And uh, we were able to test out then some of the emerging urban models of the time, Burgess and so on, mm. against the picture of... And this gave me an interest in industrial location, which I carried forward uh, steadily. Of course, the whole work which I was engaged on, the big book was going to come out on the... Mm the industries of Birmingham, the location problem. The war came. And the war, yes. The war Tell me about a, what the there war. There was only one option then. One had to join the army. The army. At what age? Well, in 1940, I joined up, I think. No, 1939, I joined up, but I was allowed a year off. Uh -huh. uh, they had so many people joining up there. In fact, uniforms in the war. Mm -hmm. So I had effectively another year, and I finally joined in 1940. Having joined the army in 1939, they called me up in 1940. And that took me all over the Middle East, eventually to Italy, following the Eighth Army. In uh, uh, what, what branch? Oh, in the army. First yes. in the guns, mm -hmm. then in infantry. So I walked up a lot of hills in Italy. Mm -hmm. And I got back to the University of Birmingham early in 1946. And my work uh, was then well known because during the war in Britain, a large number of uh, little organizations had sprouted, looking at the problems of bomb damage, lack of investment in cities, how we could redevelop and build new cities. And I was uh, uh, taken into the work of a group called the West Midland Group on Post-War Reconstruction and Planning, a very long title. Essentially, a civic university, multidisciplinary. And we sat around there, and the geographical evidence was amazingly useful. 
We eventually produced a book called Conurbation, which was mm -hmm. one of the early post-war yes. planning studies, perhaps a little too idealistic, mm. not quite practical enough to have effect, but it's still useful. What were its main sorts of uh, themes? Was it something along the line of Ebenezer Howard, or was it... Uh, well, of course, the, was Ebenezer was one of the initiators of the, the ideal city's tradition. Yes. And one of our questions at that time was how far the, to that particular West Midland conurbation, how far the Ebenezer Howard New Town solution yeah. was appropriate. Uh, it proved to be very appropriate in the Greater London yes. situation. It wasn't immediately adapted in the West Midlands, uh, though new towns have since been developed there. But I, at that time, was not in favour of the uh, Ebenezer Howard solution for the West Midland. Why? On simple grounds that the geographical circumstances there, a conurbation, Birmingham and the Black Country together, of uh, two and a half million people at most, that A, uh, given proper uh, organization and use of land, there was land within the conurbation, within the Black Country. There was land on the fringe of Birmingham which could have been developed quite quickly without loss of amenity, without loss of first-class agricultural land. But at that time, I was in favor of an expansive approach to the present city, rather than the planting of new towns in the kind of city regions. So the you wanted concentration, concentration yeah. rather than decentralization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, my logic behind that was partly that land was available, partly the economics of a situation in Birmingham where a very large number of small-scale industries existed together, often in localized quarters, like the gun and the jewelry quarters that I wrote about, uh, because of the advantages of linkage and co-location. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think I was proved right in this by subsequent events. And, uh, there wasn't the same drive to decentralize industry as there had been in the case of the London. So it was, it was the economies of agglomeration That's rather right. than scale That's right. that These were, were important. Yes. The mm. linkage economy. Mm. I wrote a little bit about them. Mm. Uh, but uh, I found that work it was really financed by the Cadbury family. Private the foundation. people who were Quakers, you know. And in the best Quaker tradition, established the most efficient industry they could, but used the revenue profits derived from that to good works and good causes. And this group was one of the... Fascinating. Yeah. The chocolate factories in France that have sponsored some things. Mm -hmm. Cadbury's always have, still oh, have I this. I didn't realize this great So now we're talking for They'd be very helpful to geographers and saw the value of geographical... Cadbury's. Yes. They're still being helpful to us. Yeah. But, uh, another story. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> anyway, I was working away on all this, and one day I happened to lead a field excursion through the coal fields of the West Midlands on the occasion of a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And on that field excursion were three well-known geographers, Dudley Stamp, as he then was, became Sir Dudley Stamp later, mm -hmm. R. Edward Cannon, the economic geographer, and Sidney Wooldridge, great geomorphologist. Yeah. And after the excursion, they asked me if I was interested in going to London. A mm -hmm. uh, job was available at the London School of Economics. Uh, S.H. Beaver, the economic geographer, had gone to the University of King. They wanted an economic geographer. This is the 50s now. This is 51. 51. Five years teaching at London. Uh -huh. So I went to LSE. And that was a major turning point in my academic life. Mm -hmm. While Birmingham had been splendid, stimulating local applied activities, mm -hmm. invigorating, I'd also done a lot of work from documentary sources on the mm -hmm. evolution of the city, its history, the 18th century story, which I thoroughly enjoyed and never finished. Uh, going to London was a, quite a traumatic experience, two points of view. One at LSE, the uh, atmosphere was quite different from that of a provincial university, non-departmentalized, highly interdisciplinary, social sciences exclusively, economists, economic mm. historians, anthropologists, political, political scientists, scientists, all interested in 
what one another was up to, mm -hmm. all meeting every day at the common room, talking away. Mm, a number of flourishing interdisciplinary groups to which one could belong. No question about what geography was or was it important. You were there involved yes. and they wanted contributions mm -hmm. straight off, so it was a stimulating. Then they offered me the chance to develop a new course on the industrial geography, economic geography of industry. That's been, that was a very rewarding experience. Very good students came along. And now they're all over the world doing yes. industrial geography. Yes. Much greater depth mm. of theory and practice than I would ever have been able to do marvelous. But it was the halcyon days of industrial location, wasn't it? Well, that's right. It was pinned, on, it was pinned yes. on industrial location. Yes. yes. Uh, mm. There wasn't an awful lot written yeah. by geographers of uh, depth. I remember relying a lot at the time, developing this new course, on the work of Hoover. Yes. Who supplied work in the United yes. States during the war yes. years was very important. And Ullman had that as well. Well, yes, he came into it a bit Basically. later from my own personal point of view, though I know he'd been mm -hmm. working too. Immediately it was Hooper who was more important. Mm -hmm. And of course Walter Isaac, yes. who I got to know. And mm -hmm. uh, the theoretical side was built into the course. And we attempted to relate this. So in fact, that could be one of the sources of regional science. Well, of course, <laughs> yes, though I rather Having been very interested in the early days of regional science, mm -hmm. and having been in close touch with a group of other scholars in Britain, we felt, uh, we, we founded instead a thing called the Regional Studies Association. Mm -hmm. And that was more akin to my interest in the way in which regional science developed, which became highly theoretical. The models, the simulation, the regional yeah. studies. We tried to keep this in term, in, in touch with real questions, mm -hmm. national, international interest, questions of the effect of public policy on regions, on mm -hmm. urban development, urban life, the location of industry policy. Mm -hmm. Was it a success or not? Yeah. And mm -hmm. we, the regional. Um, Studies Association still goes quite mm. well. I'd really like you to get into that. How was it that the theories of industrial location, which were suggested, did or did not work? Well, uh, I mean, the world is a very complex place. Yes. And uh, did any of it work? <laughs> I think the, the people have said I'm a positivist. Have been, I suppose, very right. nicely. Some of my best but friends. But the uh, oh, all right, all right, I know. The, um, the theories were great guide, great help, mm -hmm. uh, testing out Weber's we did. Uh, you can do it by various means, a very sophisticated way now. A lot of uh, that was very useful, guide to understanding. And then, of course, I found Lersch, a very, very stimulating book indeed. Mm -hmm. Wrote a long review, built that into our teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a good deal in Lersch, mm -hmm. which God uh, has hadn't yet fully developed, I think. Greenhut had a go, too. Yes. He was uh, mm. made some useful contribution. Mm. But a lot of my people have developed behavioral approaches. Uh -huh. And there, of course, is a part of the answer to your question. Mm. The only the partial relevance of the theoretical, classical mm. theoretical side. But I think the behavioral side has produced some very useful understandings and insights. Perhaps, yes, but in a historic context, there was a period in the post-war, in the 50s and even into the early 60s, yeah. where, where central place theory was a kind of catechism for mm -hmm. applied geography, location of schools or hospitals or industries yeah. or what. And you must have been very intimately involved with that. Need, yes. Yes. Okay. Have you seen any cases where it really worked, or cases where it dramatically did not work? Well, it did. Uh, <coughs> tried to uh, take the case of the Netherlands, where it formed the basis for the establishment of cities in the reclaimed holders, mm -hmm. Delta plan, Indian planning, mm -hmm. perhaps overestimated the value of mm -hmm. central place approach at times. Should mm -hmm. uh, Juan Mal is here, he'll mm -hmm. discuss that question with you. Mm -hmm. He studied it in great detail with relevance to Indian urban planning, mm -hmm. regional planning. Mm -hmm. We've tested it out in Britain, 
looked at the pattern as it has built up, as it has developed, just as Kristalla did in, in South mm. Germany. And uh, one can see that there is force mm. in, the, uh, in the theory. But it, uh, again, regions differ, areas differ, yes. physical circumstances, mm. social, industrial life is different. Mm. Yes. No, it, it is a, I found it a very helpful guide. Yes. For thinking and analysis. Mm -hmm. yes. A tool that one can employ. So urban industrial economic geography yeah. was your primary focus. And right. the people who uh, helped you, wh who were the most important uh, people, in, apart from the books you mentioned of Hoover and Lersch, who were the people of your generation that were more enthusiastic for that line, urban industrial? Um, well, you see, Stamp and Buchanan, who were the heads of that institution, the geography department, were both very Catholic in their outlook. Mm. Buchanan in particular saw the value of a strongly disciplined economic geography. His own work reveals that. Mm. Discipline based essentially in economics, mm. economic history, mm. as well as in geography. So that um, they were immensely supportive and helpful in developing what was then the only course of its kind in, in Britain mm -hmm. and producing new people. A little bit later, of course, uh, I mean, that course already yeah. began experiments in quantification mm -hmm. um, before the great wave of quantification and before the great wave of uh, Haggett and Chorley. Mm -hmm. We were already thinking along those lines. Haggett and Chorley came along and picked up these ideas and spread them, disseminated mm -hmm. them very splendidly, mm -hmm. I think admirably in every mm -hmm. respect. And they remain very good friends, Haggett in particular. Is, I think. Any, yes, ex is there any distinction between, uh, is there much cooperation between the London School of Economics geography tradition, of urban industrial geography, and the Cambridge Bristol access? Are Not now, no, it lapsed, but for a time we used to organize a seminar with the people of Bristol and Cambridge, mm -hmm. a postgraduate seminar. That's lapsed for one reason, partly because I think our graduate schools grew in size and became sufficient unto themselves. There was yes. sufficient diversity. Mm. In it's a pity in a way. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it ought to be a powerhouse there. redeveloped, but yes. uh, the London-Bristol axis was very mm. strong at that time. Mm. Mm. But the other, I, I did want to mention one other point um, about LSE. And that was the change from working in a very good, happy provincial university you know, to working in a centre which already had a very strong international yes. reputation. Mm. The, uh, the difference was um, charismatic, you yes. see. Stamp had this great reputation. Yes and brought students to LSE from all over the world, especially at that time from Southern Asia, India. Yes, and Israel. The Indian subcontinent. Mm. Yes. Uh, less now for, unfortunately, for financial reasons, come from India, who Pakistan. F who funded those trips? Those trips uh, they were able to get money from various sources, including the British Council, British various Council. overseas aid sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them were able to come on their own funds. What? So coming to LSE then began, I suppose, your international career. Yes, yes, I think that's that's true. Hmm? It's a break in that. How did that opened up new vistas in the first place? You find uh, all these splendid overseas students wanting their supervision, and advice, discussion. One learned from them problems of their, their own universities, their own. Uh, schools of geography, problems of regional planning, urban development, industrial location, they were studying. And that was marvelous. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And of course, one meets these students now, yes. conferences like this, renews acquaintance, and they keep in touch with me. But then there were the opportunities to, uh, well, the IGU itself, mm. Stockholm Congress, 1960, I had, was invited to chair an economic geography session or two. And that began to put me in touch with some of the figures on the international scene. William William Olson, uh -huh, you know, met well, him. a splendid 
Marvelous. still going strong. Uh, Julian Saushkin uh -huh. of Moscow, uh, Chauncey Harris of uh, Chicago, yes. Donna Arpi of Sweden, the German economic geographers, mm -hmm. and uh, one found ourselves in communication on reports, changing off prints and publications. And that was really marvelous. Wasn't Were you in the Commission on Applied Geography? No, never, no. never, never. That was assembled in Stockholm. Never, it was, yes. No, I remained uh, an economic geographer in this sense and never joined that commission. Mm. But the idea you involved me more and more. Mm. Stamp was a helpful influence there. Of course, we had to prepare for the 1964 Congress in London. Yes. And I was chairman of the program committee. Mm -hmm. So there was correspondence with geographers all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one found out more of what was happening in, in, in uh, other countries, in Latin America or in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that was a great experience, too, running that conference. Mm -hmm. And one went on from then to become a member of the executive committee and eventually mm. president of the ITU. And for me, the ITU is one of the essential institutions for geography. Why? What does it do? Undoubted. Well, it represents for our subject a principle which I think is undoubtedly one of the great principles of the internationality of science. Mm -hmm. If we cease as a subject to involve ourselves in international discussion, international exchange, communicating the results of our research worldwide, arguing with people with whom we may or may not agree. International is absolutely fundamental in the modern world, the world as it will be. And I think we must uphold that. Well, and there's a cost in upholding it. And the cost is giving time to people from other countries sometimes taking one's mind off local issues, national issues, onto international issues. I think that's very important, mm -hmm. and the IGU, while I've been associated with it, has grown in a number of countries. We now have over 90 countries. Mm -hmm. There are more yet to join. But the, uh, we've been bringing into this circle of discussion and dissemination people from more and more environments, more mm -hmm. and more backgrounds. No, my the, the, the achievement, and I will speak of it as an mm. achievement, which I most pleased me in all this, was the successful outcome of all the negotiations over the mem re membership of China. Uh -huh. We were able to bring China back. Well, now here is a country that should never not have been. Yes, yes. And now China is here at this conference as a full yes. member, and that yes. really gave me great pleasure. That's wonderful. You think it's doing it as effective a job in, in promoting international communication as it could? Well, I think it could do better. Mm -hmm. And the present executive committee is thinking of ways by which it could do better. But I find great pleasure in recording the fact that there are 42 commissions and working groups. Mm -hmm. Not all of them equally successful, it's true. But the majority doing a very good job, mm -hmm. meeting regularly, producing books, papers, I hope increasingly in the future developing good research programs. I think this is the need now. Geography is a very good teaching subject, very good descriptive work. It's got to be more forthcoming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in its approach to the development of research mm -hmm. and presenting its research clearly to other scientists. And IGU can be very helpful in well. that respect. But this IGU experience was not the only international. Yes, I've had yes. great pleasure in other. I found myself, uh, why I don't know, on the University Grants Committee for Hong Kong. Uh -huh. There was a splendid old university. Needed a bit of new life. There was some money for it. We had to found a Chinese university in Hong Kong. And then a polytechnic. Now this took me out to the Far East a lot. And I uh, could renew acquaintance with friends in Japan, which I'd previously visited. Lots of friends there. Studied the Japanese experience. And on my way back to Britain, stop in India, Bangladesh. Renew acquaintances there. So this was quite a marvelous experience. Mm -hmm. Followed by an invitation, which I think Walter Mansard must have engineered, to serve on various committees of the United Nations University uh -huh. in Tokyo. There the task was presenting geography, not by that name, no. but geographical problems and approaches 
and securing the involvement of geographers in a number of their programs, particularly those which Walter directed brilliantly on natural resources and natural resource development. And I think this led me to shift my interest a bit for a time into national resources, natural resources, mm -hmm. away from uh, manufacturing right. industry. Mm -hmm. But that too was a very rewarding experience. So the United Nations University was able to link with IGU in the shape of a number of IGU commissions mm -hmm. and promote joint activities, such as those on uh, mountain regions, the mm -hmm. coastal development studies in Southeast Asia, and others, all uh, to this uh, ability that Walter had mm -hmm. to draw together the geographers and the yes. United Nations University in its developing phase. I hope very much that will continue. Good, good. But these were all great international mm -hmm. experiences. And meanwhile, one could always go back home to LSE and arrive home with pleasure. And there was the same school, vigorous, yeah, yeah. demanding, yes. and uh, students waiting at the door. And without students, academic life is nothing you keep. Now, teaching was important for you. Yes, absolutely yes. fundamental. And now, what is your present research interest? Well, at present, I've got three main. I'm retired now from yes. LSE for a year. I have three duties, mainly. One uh, is the continuing chairmanship of a committee of the Department of Transport in Britain. Uh, it's a committee on the landscaping of trunk roads. Mm -hmm. And we advise the Department of Transport on the alignment of new routes mm -hmm. for roads motorways, bypasses, mm -hmm. and on their landscape treatment. And I think that's work which is a great joy. It's a lot of field work is involved. And I, I think we can claim that the, the road environment of Britain is a little better than it might have been. Uh -huh. Had this interdisciplinary, geographers are strongly represented on it, this interdisciplinary committee not been able to influence the work of engineers and uh, mm -hmm. road designers. Secondly, I um, uh, chair a, a body called the Governors of Birkbeck College in London. Birkbeck College is uh, a, uh, a college for evening students mm -hmm. who work during the day, study during the night. Very vigorous college, mm -hmm. over 150 years of history. Currently, there's a London Working Men's College, uh -huh. and I'm chairman of their governors. We have great problems getting enough money to keep the teaching and research going. Mm, sure. Financing of part-time students is a difficult problem at the moment. I think they should have much more resources devoted to them. Indeed, that we ought to be thinking much more about the whole problem of continuing education. Continuing education. And not just paying lip service to mm, it, mm. but. Um, Really putting it. more resources into mm. it. Some splendid students mm. at Birkbeck. And then I go on supervising graduate students. You uh, will write student. a few papers. You will find yes. one in next November's Geographical Journal. Wonderful. So yeah. I keep my academic work very That's wonderful. strong. And these are great joys in life to have yeah. tasks to do. And well, Get we'll on with it. Very happy note. I want to thank you so much for this interview. Great and pleasure. I it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Anne. <laughs> I hope that the IGU can fulfill your dream for what it well, should be doing. Thank, thank you. you.